Hi, I'm John Grime from the University of Chicago. I'm here speaking for the research group of Greg Voth today. So, who are we? Well, we're a research group who are mainly working in theory and simulation, but we have quite strong links to just about everybody else in the university in one way or another. So we're in the Department of Chemistry, at least ostensibly, but I'm also part of the Computation Institute, and we have very strong links with things like the James Frank Institute and the Institute for Biophysical Dynamics and all these different institutes all over the university because we're big believers in this idea of cross-disciplinary research. It's a really productive way of doing things. What we do is basically condensed matter theory modeling simulation. We're mainly interested in biomolecular systems, but we also do quite a lot of work in energy storage and things like reactive compounds, which we're not going to talk about today. We're very interested in the design and development of computational algorithms to do with the actual simulations that we perform. So enhanced sampling, things like umbrella sampling, metadynamics, and good ways of doing this. And we span quite a range of computer simulations in terms of the time and lens scales that we use. So we have quantum simulations, atomic resolution, coarse grain, which is going to be the focus of the talk today. And we have mesoscopic techniques like smooth particle hydrodynamics and things like this. So viruses seem to be pretty popular at this symposium today, which I think is not something you're going to hear too often as a sentence. So we deal on blue waters a lot with HIV-1, lots of aspects of the viral life cycle, like the immature lattice self-assembly and budding. We have RNA-driven nucleation and growth of viral capsids. And we have things like cleavable models of the gag polypeptide. So we also look at membrane protein systems, sort of the dynamics of integrin and the assembly of focal adhesions. And we look at the membrane remodeling that you get from bar domain proteins. And what we try to do is to complement the conventional experimental techniques. So we work very closely with people who work in X-ray crystallography, NMR, and uh, cryotomography, and things like this. And we try and provide information that you can't easily get from the conventional experiments. So why are we using blue waters? And the flippant answer would be because it's fast and it's big. But there's actually something more important here. We do a lot of software development, fairly cutting edge stuff. And the Blue Water system has a lot of very skilled technical staff on hand to help you with many of the implementation details. And for me in particular, that's been absolutely invaluable to actually generating the software that we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to be talking about some work that we performed using a custom parallel simulation code that we used. And it does some fairly sophisticated things to do with load balancing and sparse data techniques to try and keep the computational overheads down and let us run really large simulations without needing too much memory. And this was developed under a Blue Waters PRAC sub-award. So we were in quite close collaboration with the Blue Waters staff when we wrote the software. So I'm going to be talking about coarse grain models. And it's a good idea to try and figure out what a coarse grain model is, first of all. And simply, we remove degrees of freedom from a detailed model. So if you think about a sort of continuum of models, at the low level, we have the sort of atomistic models with solvents. I'm not discussing quantum stuff today. This is purely classical mechanics. If we sort of remove the solvents, we could still have an atomic representation of the molecules only without the water, for example, and that's maybe a slightly simplified version of the same system. You can have a coarse grain solvent-free model, which again, we reduce the number of actual atoms we're simulating, so we can maybe condense multiple atoms into single pseudoparticles while still trying to capture the same physics of the system. And the sorts of things that we're trying to do are these very aggressively coarse grain models, because these will really allow us to push computer simulation to sort of cell scale processes. And hopefully what I'm talking about today is a demonstration of the sort of techniques that we're using and where we're going with these things. So as an example of a coarse grain model, what I'm showing you here is a viral particle from HIV-1. So the spherical thing we see on the left-hand side is referred to as a virion. And if we take a little close in zoom of this, I've tried to indicate some, uh, some of these regions that we have in the system with the colored bars. So what we see is a radial arrangement of these special gag molecules, kind of like spokes in a bicycle wheel. And the different colors we have here are different functional protein domains of the gag. In this current form, this viral particle is not infectious. So we need to actually cleave these little protein domains free and then they'll go off and into the viral particle and they'll do different tasks that are necessary to make the viral particle infectious. So we can approach this by looking at the experimental data 
And if we can't run the detailed simulations, then what we can do is we can do a sort of structural analysis. We can say, what are the conserved motifs inside these molecules? For this particular uh, protein we're going to be talking about, that's largely alpha helices that we know from X-ray crystallography and NMR are well conserved across all of these different situations. And we can generate some sort of a structural representation. So here I'm talking about ENMs, which are elastic network models. And we use these harmonic bonds between particles to basically try and maintain the local structure and how the local structures are positioned relative to one another. And on top of that, we can place some excluded volume onto these little pseudoparticles, which means that the sort of packing that we see with the molecules when they self-assemble, for example, doesn't really violate any sort of um, size constraints in the molecule itself. And we can then graft on interactions that we know are important from mutation data. So like hydrophobic surfaces, we can have electrostatic interactions, things like this. And it's a generalized sort of approach to creating a coarse grain model of the biological system given the experimental data that we have. The experimental data obviously is frequently static. We can't necessarily see how it's working uh, in a dynamic sense, but ideally we'll have enough information in the static experimental structures that will let us make at least a first pass model of the coarse grain systems. So an example I'm gonna talk about today is the self-assembly of something called the capsid protein inside HIV. So we have a simplified diagram here of the viral life cycle and it starts with a sort of budding event where these gag molecules congregate at the cell surface and it then forms a sort of spherical budding site which is then removed from the cell. And it's this virion, the spherical thing that moves away from the cell that's actually carrying the infection to other cells. But we need something quite specific to happen to that virion before it becomes infectious. And on the right hand side of the image you can see this sort of characteristic purely circular structure which is the immature virion. And the gag lattice is cleaved by a specific enzyme, and you have various things going on to do with self-assembly processes that will eventually give you this green cone-shaped thing shown there. That's the viral capsid, and we need that to be present, otherwise the virus is not infectious. So that's what we're going to focus on here. Without the cone-shaped capsid, we don't have viral infection. The actual cone-shaped capsid itself is made up of a single protein that's capable of sort of self-assembling in a quasi-equivalent way to make these hexagonal regions, shown in green, or these pentagonal regions, which are shown in red. And it turns out that the protein in solution is dimeric. So you have two copies of this capsid protein that come together on their C-terminal domains to give you this sort of wing-shaped structure. And these dimers basically self-assemble inside the maturing variant to give you the cone-shaped structure. And the viral RNA is inside that cone. So it's kind of like a suit of armor for the viral genome. So this is drastically sped up, but we can see that just by looking at the protein that's aggregated into this assembling capsid, we see the quasi-equivalent formation of the uh, hexagon shown in green and the pentagon shown in red, starting as a sort of folding sheet model. So we have an initial nucleation event. The sheet grows out from that, and it sort of uses its spontaneous curvature to fold around on itself and begin to assemble these cone-shaped structures. And by using the coarse grain model to examine this sort of a process, we try to identify some of these important structures that occur on the way to generating this cone-shaped structure. And we found that the protein dimers floating around rapidly form a sort of population of these triangles that are formed of three of these dimers coming together. So I've color-coded them here, so you can see that one of the dimers has red, one has green, one has blue in the top part of the screen. And we found that these triangles form a sort of nucleating structure from which the capsid growth proceeds. So you have a triangle floating around, you have additional dimers coming in and adding to it, and they form sort of contiguous triangles moving around in a circle until we finally form this green hexagon in the middle, and that structure's fairly stable. And it's from this structure that we think that the actual capsid lattice growth proceeds when we're generating the cone. So one of the other things that we can look at in this sort of a model is what happens when this capsid structure gets introduced into a cell as part of the infection process. So we need to get this capsid from the virion floating around somewhere in your body to the interior of a cell. And once it gets inside the cell, the capsid has to break apart to release the viral RNA to help this sort of infection process to occur. One of the nice things about the coarse grain modeling is we can actually look at this sort of a process a sort of simulated rapid dilution, where what we do is we reduce the background concentration of the assembly competent protein to mimic the effects of inserting the viral contents into the cell itself. So anyone who's familiar with molecular simulation will know what periodic boundary conditions are. For those of you who don't, the video I'm about to show you in the top left-hand corner of the screen here is actually wrapped in, around the corners of these box. So what you'll see looks a little bit strange sometimes because the structure will leave one side of the video and come in through the other. But nonetheless, the takeaway message from this here 
is that when you have exposed lattice edges in these structures, you know, if you don't have a full capsid, if there's some sort of a flaw in there, some sort of a seam or a rip in the local structure, it breaks apart very quickly under rapid dilution conditions. So we have exposed edges all over the place here, and by having a sort of simulated rapid dilution, the structure rapidly breaks apart, and there's nothing left in the end, which is important for the actual um, biological characteristics of the system, as I'll come to in a moment. But when we have systems that don't have exposed edges, such as one that will pop up here in a moment, all the little structures that we assemble with exposed edges fall apart very rapidly, but there's one particular structure there that's a sec it's effectively a sealed surface, although you can't see that too well in the particular video we have here. But that's very resistant to breaking apart under rapid dilution. If you have exposed edges, things dissolve away from the exposed edges. If you have a sealed sort of unit, the thing stays intact under these sorts of conditions. And we believe that this is important in terms of the actual cellular response to viruses. There's a particular protein called TRIM that binds very weakly to viral capsids. And it seems to have something to do with how that capsid breaks apart in the body, but nobody really understands what it does because the binding is extremely weak. And one of our working hypotheses at the moment is that the TRIM binding is very weak, but it's strong enough to induce very local rips in the structure of the capsid. And then the capsid protein simply dissolves away from the edges of the structure under the influence of rapid dilution. So uh, I tried to keep the actual hardcore domain-specific science to a minimum here because I figured we have a fairly disparate audience and it's best to simply describe what we're using the Blue Waters facility for. So if anyone has any technical questions about this, feel free to speak to me later. But the final words, thanks a lot to the experimental collaborators. So the Jensen Lab at Caltech does a lot of very, very good um, cryotomography work. Mark Yeager is a superb crystallographer at the University of Virginia, as is Owen Ponilos and Barbie, who are both also at the University of Virginia and helped us a lot with the actual crystallographic structures of these proteins that we're looking at. Obviously, thanks to the NSF for uh, providing the Blue Waters facility. The Blue Water support staff have been absolutely invaluable, particularly Robert Bruner, who is no doubt sick of me at this point because I send the guy the most bizarre questions at all times of the day and night. And he's long suffering. Thank you once again, Robert, and the other both group members. So I guess if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Uh, maybe a comment as much as a question. It would be wonderful to see if coarse grain methods were sufficiently accurate to distinguish between a good antibody and a bad antibody uh, docking with a viral coat protein, a viral you know entry protein. On, on the basis of shape, I would say that it probably would. If it was interfering with the structure of the protein, like some of the um, antiviral treatments that we use for HIV seem to be interfering with the natural motions of the protein, I think those would be fairly straightforward to use in a coarse grain system. The self-assembly of models like this is tricky to parameterize from the more detailed simulations because you have very weak interactions between the proteins. So weak, in fact, that I'm not convinced that our current force fields at an atomistic scale would give us a very good representation of what the effective binding of these things were because I've tried to run detailed simulations and it seems to overstabilize a lot of the protein-protein interactions. So in principle, we could run the detailed simulations and basically parameterize the protein-antibody interactions or whatever it was you'd be interested in using the detailed simulations. But we'd have to be very careful to always check the experimental data to make sure we're consistent with that. I was originally an experimental guy and I have a mania for looking at what the experimental data tells us before we really start simulating because it's very easy to get the wrong result from simulation unless you're careful to check against the experimental information that you have. So in answer to the question, I think yes, we could do that, but we'd have to be very careful about how we determined what the interaction parameters were between the protein and whatever it is we'd like to see the interactions with. 